God hates effeminacy. Not being feminine, but effeminacy. The effeminate is a, an affront to God. But most um, people don't understand, uh, and I thought it would be good to talk about uh, the thing that really everyone needs. They need to know they're loved. And um, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And when you talk of love, you're not talking of human love. Human love is basically self-fulfilling, selfish, self-centered, and destructive. And most people mistake love for human love. And human love in the scripture uh, is a totally different word than God's love, which is agape. And one of the things that's not understood by most people is that human love is the most destructive force in the world. The carnal mind, the Bible says, is enmity against God. It cannot be subject to the law of God. It cannot bring a person into life. And where you have a carnal mind and a carnal way of thinking and a carnal way of living and a carnal way of loving, it is the most self-centered, self-indulgent and violent type of love and very destructive. And you go to many places and... Uh, what we have is humanism put forth as God's love, a humanistic attitude, a humanistic way. Uh, no man is a man unless he has God's love, which changes his image and makes him a partaker of a divine nature that brings with it the true love of God, which actually has the attributes that most people would consider women's attributes. In other words, if a man does not discover what tenderness is, if a man can't express tenderness, don't ever think that he has the love of God. He doesn't. If a man can't express compassion and care, if a man can't express true paternal instinct, then he hasn't got the love of God. And when you start uh, looking at people, uh, the bullishness of people, you know, uh, especially in the olden days, um, you had this idea that um, somehow men were above women. The truth is this, that when God made man, male and female made he them, and he made them in his image. The problem was that when they lost the image of God, which happened to fall, man adopted one standard and woman adopted another standard. And instead of fulfilling the role God intended, they had an unregenerate nature. And the whole of society and the whole of culture developed a wrong idea of what a man should be and a woman should be. And so we've been struggling with the conflict and the world's values and the world's ideas. And when we come to Scripture, we always find that God's wanting to reveal himself, but he can only reveal himself through the nature of God. And the nature of God is totally different from the nature of man. 
My ways aren't your ways, says God. My thoughts aren't your thoughts. It's different. Same for a woman. And most people never experience love and never engage in true worship nor engage in life in God because they do what Adam and Eve did right at the start. As soon as sin came, they hid. And man locks himself with fear in hiding. And when you hide from God, you actually destroy yourself. You oppose yourself. And the church of Jesus Christ is to set people free. The first thing that happens in the church of Jesus Christ when a person's truly born again is they become open-faced. Open-faced, open-hearted, and they learn love is something you love the brethren because Christ loved you. If you can't love those whom God has begotten, you certainly aren't begotten of God. And you start examining people and you look at people and you realize how locked up they are in themselves. The worst thing for a man is selfishness, self-centeredness. How many times I've See, marriages break down, and it's the demands of the husband. My Bible says that um, to husbands in Ephesians, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. We ought to lay down our lives for our wives, it says. Husbands, you've got to love your wife. You've got to lay down your life. So a man, God knew, was going to take a wrong attitude and mistake totally how it should be in life. You know, if society is wrong, it's the men that are wrong. We demand of women that they play a certain role, but it's the men that need to wake up and play the right role. And of course, when you start telling people that, uh, the men get kind of defensive. You know, you get the bullying man who thinks well, his wife should do as he says. Well, that shows he's totally unregenerate. And what people don't understand is everyone is fighting a battle inside until they find peace with Christ. And the battle causes the manifestation of their lives to be different. But the battle is very clear. My Bible says the strongholds of Satan are in the mind, in the reasonings and imaginations. And it's how a person thinks. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And what happens in people's lives is they, they get locked up, and then what they exhibit... And what they show is what they want people to see. What they are is something different. They're locked in their thoughts. They think. And they become. And their reactions outwardly hide an inward cry for help. Now, they don't express it that way, nor do they see it that way. But man basically has a need of God. There's something inside a man that only the true God can fulfill. And so they struggle with themselves. They war with themselves. Their minds fight. You know... There's a difference between religion and God's love. God's love is merciful. God's love is full of grace. God's love is totally different. And most people, because they don't understand the cry of a person's heart, they're very condemning. People react outwardly.
because of the need that's inside. And, and it's so, so ridiculous. The violence that you see in people is basically their own ignorance, inability to deal with themselves, inability to respond to love, and in the end they get violent against love because they're driven by a seed within them that's totally destructive. And in the end it will destroy them. And Jesus Christ came to save. He came to heal. He came to deliver. And we have to understand how God operates, how the love of God operates. And when you understand the way God is, you can respond. The only reason a man doesn't respond to the love of God is he just un doesn't understand what love is. And I thought it'd be good tonight to give you a few examples from Scripture because it's easy to come to Scripture and look and see the way it is and the way God is. You know, God doesn't evaluate the things the way we do. Uh, I, I remember when I got converted, I'd gone to a meeting to prove that God didn't exist. It was a very hard objective to fulfill. Uh, in fact, I failed. However, uh, you know, God met me not because I was seeking him. He seeks me. God meets a person not because of them seeking him at all. The more violent a person gets against truth, the real thing is inside they can't live with themselves. There was a man. He got so angry because he was like Muhammad, except he was a Jew. And he got so angry and full of hate because he felt that the only way to know God was to know an austere God, a severe God. And all the time he was like, I suppose, the man who was given one talent and would say, I know that you're an austere Lord, and he went and hid his talent. His whole view of God was one of severity, and a lot of people, their idea of God is really one of severity. They've got guilt in their life, guilt in their hearts. They know they're doing wrong, and the one thing they don't want to do is be confronted, and they don't want to come near to this God who they see as an austere, vengeful, judgmental God and so they hide and the only way to live with themselves is to be violent against truth they're violent in their minds they're violent in their conscience and here was one who got so violent that the only thing he could do was he could think of killing every Christian he could get hold of his name was Saul And he went and he demanded letters so that anyone he found who worshipped Christ, he could kill him. Now, in our day and age, they don't do that. They just speak evil. And so the violence was inside the man. Here was a man who had been amongst a crowd, and when Stephen, the evangelist, was stoned to death, he was a deacon in the church, was stoned to death, he was a man full of the Holy Ghost, it says his face shone like an angel's. And the people, when they heard him, and they heard what he said, instead of acknowledging that Christ had come to redeem them, they closed their ears, they gnashed their teeth, they ran on him, and they killed him. The violence was not against Stephen, 
It was against the word that he spoke. They didn't want to face their need. They didn't want to face what was wrong inside. And so the only thing to do is to destroy that which was inside. And here's a man, face shining like an angel. And he said, I see heaven open. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they killed him. And you think, what logic is it to kill a person who heals the sick, delivers the captive, has life? What spirit is it that is so destructive within a man or woman that will kill the very source of hope? Would choke out the very one who would help him? And so his rage built. His anger built. His mind twisted. And he went fuming. And you think, well, how can someone fume at what's good? And then we discover the love of God. Here he was with letters in his hand, determined to kill, determined to destroy. And as he goes down the way, he gets a shock. All of a sudden, a great light shines. And he hears a voice out of the light. And he falls to the ground. Saul, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. It's a hard life when you kick against what's good because of the hatred that's in you. It's hard to try and stem that voice inside that tells you what's right and you rise up with violence because you're wrong. And here comes the Lord. He's saying to Saul, the first thing he says, well, it's hard for you, isn't it? Real hard to kick against the pricks of conscience. It's real hard to fight God. I'll tell you, if you're fighting God tonight, there's only going to be one loser, and it's not going to be God. Guess who that could be? Fight they do. Fight the good fight of faith, except they fight the bad fight of unbelief. Won't yield. Paul says, Who art thou? Jesus' answer, I'm Jesus. whom thou persecutest. You know, the problem's not man. The problem's not individuals. If you want to know who the problem is, problem's you. It's always the individual. It's nice to blame someone else, but really the buck stops with you. You're the one. I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. You know, why would God come to someone so violently against him, so violently opposed? Reveal himself, save him, Forgive him, redeem him, and bring him to life. Why would Paul, who claimed that he sought God, be so violent against the only one who could save him? 
What is it in man's nature, sinful nature, a woman's sinful nature, that will cause a man to be so violent or a woman to be so violent against the only answer to life? What logic is there in fighting God? You can only enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, and that is a short season. Christ came to give us life, and life more abundant. He came to show the world the nature of the Father. The reason that Christ, uh, and we talk about the woman's seed that brings redemption. The reason that Christ came, he was born of the seed of woman. The reason he came was to reveal to mankind the very nature of God. And the nature of God is a nature of compassion. God sees what man doesn't see. God sees the war that goes on inside a person. God knows what's really happening inside a person. Outside, you see all sorts of manifestations. But the real thing is, when a man is locked in sin, or when a woman's locked in sin, and when the nature conflicts with the nature of God, you're going to get such a hatred rise up. How many times have I heard a woman say, my husband says, you know, I'm self-righteous. What really the husband is saying, that he is violently against God. Problem is, inside, God looks on the inward man. How many times I hear someone say, well, you know, I, I, why should I? We're free. No. The real hatred you have is God. You hate him. You hate his way. You hate his life. You want to live yours. You want to go your way. You want to do your thing. And it'll kill you. I'm amazed how many people rise up with such a violent hatred, especially when they don't want to go God's way. Boy, will they make excuses for their sin. Boy, will they justify what's wrong. And that's what Paul was doing. Religious man justifying everything. Got letters from the high priest and the Sanhedrin so he could kill anyone who spoke the name Jesus. But who was he fighting? He was fighting God. He was fighting life. He was fighting light. Why would a man hate God? That's a mystery to me. A greater mystery to me is what inspires an individual to be violent against God. A greater mystery to me is why would anyone come to someone who offers you life and life more abundant, who offers you a way of out of misery into something of joy and hope. Why would anyone fight it? I mean, is sin so precious? What is it that ticks in an individual? They, their will so precious, their own way so precious, that they despise the God who came and bled and died to redeem them. How can a man or a woman go after their own way? And here comes Jesus. Hey, Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Boy, can you imagine how that stirred him up? Suddenly he's confronted. Who are you? I'm Jesus whom thou persecuted. You know, really, in life, there's only two powers. You're either under the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience, or you're in Christ. 
disobedience to those that choose to go against God and God's principles and God's way. They're under the prince of the power of the air. Uh, and he's a murderer. He's a thief. He's a liar. And he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And if you're under his rule, the only thing that's going to happen to you is he's going to steal everything from you and every opportunity from you. He's in the end going to destroy you and then he's going to kill you. And then there's a good shepherd and the only thing the good shepherd wants to do is give you life and life more abundant. And he's come to lay down his life for the sheep. Now, why would anyone who's sane and in their right mind side with someone who's come to steal everything you have, destroy everything in your life, and then to kill you at the end? What purpose is there in lunacy? Siding with the devil. Except that your nature's part of his nature. As Jesus said, you're of your father the devil. The works that he does, you'll do. That's what he told the Pharisees. And here we have a good shepherd who will lay down his life for the sheep, who's come to give us life and life more abundant, who's come to bring hope where there is no hope, who's come to bring healing where there's disease, who's come to bring deliverance where there's bondage, and yet people would rather live under the dominion of the devil and go his way than turn around and say, hey, time to change. Why would anyone choose hate rather than love? Why would anyone choose violence rather than peace? Why would anyone choose death rather than life? I mean, it's not even rational. Except for the perverted mind. And here comes Jesus. Hey, Paul! Hard for you to kick against the pricks. I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. Your real problem is a problem with God. That's where it all lies. You haven't got a problem with yourself. You haven't got a problem with people. Your problem's with God. And when you start pointing out to people their problems, they always like to blame me. Oh, it's my husband, it's my wife, it's my... This, you know, how can I live with a woman like that? How can I live with a man like that? Hey, I tell you, your problem's with God. Make no mistake about it. You have a problem. But you see, when you're in Christ, and when you've changed from darkness to light, and when you've changed from the prince of the power of the air to the prince of the power of peace, when you come to love, and you find that you open up to the love of God, everything changes. And you begin to realize, Paul, it didn't take him long. I mean, he went to Damascus, they had to, he began to preach Christ and share that the true Savior, after he was healed, and the blindness went from him, when he went to a street called Straight, he got straightened out. And Ananias came and he said, I'm going to show you the things you've got to suffer for my name's sake. And then his whole life changed and he began to preach. And it wasn't long before he became a basket case because they had to let him down in a basket over the wall to get away. And off he went. And you know, Christ revealed so much to him. But one of the things that Christ revealed to him was love. Not man's love, God's love. And, and, you know, Paul could say something that's strange. 
He could say, you know, I nourished you as one, you know, like a mother. And you think, just a minute, the nature of God, New Jerusalem's the mother of us all. And without the compassions that most people would ascribe to a female, without the care and the tenderness, which he said he had towards the church and the people of God, without the nature of Christ, when he looked on the multitude, my Bible says he had compassion on them. He's so identified, he cared, he loved. People live with fear, uh, and perfect love casts out all fear. If you're afraid, it has torment. A lot of people are tormented with their fears. But there is no fear in God. None at all. Uh, and life, to them, is a torment. It's great when you come to the peace of God that passeth all understanding. But you can find that through love. And love is a thing that's so rare. I'm talking about God love, not human love. <laughs> when you understand how much Christ paid for you, how he shed his blood for you, how he became sin for you, and it becomes so personal, and you realize that this God in heaven when we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. When there was nothing in us that would have responded to love, when we would have destroyed it utterly if we could, at that point, Christ died for us. Paul writes and says, as enemies of God, aliens from the household of faith, totally angry, And Paul writes that people oppose themselves. <laughs> you end up opposing yourself. And, and if the truth be known, your only fight is with yourself. You know what's right. Why do you oppose what's right to do what's wrong? Uh, in the end, you end up fighting yourself. That's what Paul was doing. On the road to Damascus, there was a man full of a war within himself. And he thought if he could kill enough Christians, he'd stop the war. Lunacy. But that's the way he thought. And I find so many people, they, they get themselves stuck because they just don't understand the compassions of God how much he loves. You know, God is a pursuing God. I like what um, Spurgeon said. You know, in salvation, I did my part and God did his part. I ran, he followed, he pursued till he caught me. Uh, it's never us. When I find someone thinks they were the ones responsible for their salvation, I know they're not saved at all. When someone tells me, oh, well, I sought God, I think, poor, pathetic person. I, I know that the true salvation comes when God pursues you. My God is a God who pursues. That's why I like the hound of heaven. Why? Because I believe that's always the way it happens. For me, I realize that the human brain and the human heart cannot conceive of love. It's God who does it. And when God does it, it's wonderful. When man does it, it's awful. And I see so many people struggling. They get in this war, inward war, and they get no hope, no help. What I want to tell you is, in everyone's life, there always comes a day 
when light comes and God comes and suddenly there's an intervention that God makes and the only thing you can do is surrender. Until then, it's a tough life. It's hard. But my, when you come to the place where you stop your nonsense, it's a wonderful relief for everyone around you as well as you. It's a wonderful relief when people stop fighting God. And I guess there's only two types of people in the earth. Those are of their father, the devil, and those are of God. And the people who steal, who kill, who destroy, they can't help themselves. And they get more violent, more destructive, until, you know, there's not much in life that's enjoyable when everything around you is desolation. When your marriage is desolation, when your home's desolation, when your children are desolation, when everything's messed up, isn't it about time you said, hey, there's a problem? <laughs> and there's a savior. His name is Jesus. And our Jesus has come to give us life. You know, he, he, he's, and, and there's something about love, you know, manhood, as in, in our society, in our culture, uh, men have, have actually lost the ability to love and show affection. One of the things is if you're truly born of God, if God's really met you, for a man to be a man, any child will know security. Do you know, the children came to Jesus. They came running up. He wasn't someone the children were afraid of. The people were, the Pharisees were, but the children weren't. There was something about Jesus that was acceptable. He said, suffer the little children to come to me. You see, a tenderness comes from a spirit. And Christ took time for each one. You know, from morning till night, he played with the multitude. He just took time. Today, we're so busy, so self-absorbed, so self-centered, so self-loving, self-elevating, it's not the image of Christ and God. It's the image of greed and selfishness and self-centeredness. God wouldn't like that. Morning till night, people just came. And he healed everyone. What a God. So women, if you're going to find a man, find a man who has tenderness. Don't ever find a man who's over-assertive, over-demanding, and full of selfishness. Because it'll destroy you. Why is the society we're in so broken? Why are children so broken? I'll tell you, because men are not men anymore. It takes real manhood to have tenderness. It takes real manhood to have care. It takes real manhood to know how to love. It takes manhood to expose yourself so that you can get hurt and be prepared to be hurt. Jesus was so prepared he went to Calvary. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friend. And he laid it down his life for us when we were his enemy.
that's God's love, God's nature. 